Natalia Moreno, Jan Kramer, Chris Rowley, thank you very much for your availability and very warm welcome to the Digital Markets Research Hub, a small corner on YouTube where we try to discuss competition in digital markets. And we have this tradition uh, following up uh, on the Commission technical stakeholder workshops on the DMA to, to invite participants and active commentators to, to discuss the outcomes of the, show, of the workshop. And the, the latest one was on data related obligations of the DMA. Um, and it generated quite fruitful um, cascade of, of issues, which I propose we will be addressing today. But before, before reverting to the technicalities and more nuanced aspects, I just wanted to, to in order to set up the scene, to, to, to learn your understanding of what do we want to achieve with this ambitious and omnipotent and so amorphous tool as the DMA appears to be. Maybe we can start with Natalia. How do you understand what would be your benchmark of success of, for the DMA? So this is a very difficult question, of course. And I mean, the DMA and then the commission especially keeps referring to the to the stated goals of fairness and contestability, but then the big question is what on what on earth do these do these concepts mean? And then the commission says, ah, but they are some somewhat defined in the recitals and, and I've looked there and I, I can't quite find a definitive answer there. There either, I'm afraid. Um, and what's the cheesy saying? If you put 10, 10 people in a room, you'll get 10 different answers on, on what these concepts mean. I tend to look at it from a competition law perspective because I come from competition law. So then I see contestability and I think, okay, somehow has to do with exclusion and entry barriers. And I see fairness and I think, okay, that's maybe uh, exploitation, uh, but that's a very competition law perspective to take. There are other perspectives as well. So that also leads us, leads us nowhere. Um, but but we are seeing attempts in the literature to somehow define what these concepts mean and also more practical attempts. Okay, what type of um, outcome indicators, performance indicators do we do? Can we come up with, or or do we want to see what would be a, an accurate measure of success? And I think those attempts are very important, um, also to give shape to the DMA, but also when it comes to perhaps expanding the DMA in the future what can we put into the DMA that is not already there? Perhaps the limits of that are defined by what exactly the DMA, as it stands now, tries to tries to achieve what its goals are. Thank you. Thank you very much, Natalia. Jan, I recollect in one of your earlier papers, just on the eve of the DMA, or right after its, its, proposal, its proposal has been published by the Commission, you somehow noted that there is homonymy between contestability as understood in the economics literature and contestability as understood uh, by the DMA and how it would be colloquially understood by competition uh, people. So can you maybe reflect upon this aspect as well, if possible? No, absolutely. So um, it is true that the two terms, contestability and fairness, are, are quite fuzzy. And actually, in the first commission proposal, they weren't defined in the recitals. So that came after the fact, uh, which also gives you a, a hint that uh, it's maybe a collection of things that came and that's admitted came out of competition cases in the past and then um, we were looking for an umbrella term to, to phrase these. So contestability in the narrow sense in economic terms means you're trying to supplant the incumbent. Um, it's uh, something that limits the market power of an incumbent in, uh, in a market where there can maybe only one firm exists due to strong economies of scale or strong network effects or so on. Um, and contestability then in the narrow economic sense would mean that there is a potential entrant that at any time when you exercise your market power can step in and supplant and overtake the incumbent. Well, that clearly is a very naive view of how digital markets should work or could work. Nevertheless, some, remis some reminiscence of that is still also in the DMA. If you think about the data sharing obligation in 611, um, of search engines uh, to other search engines, that really incorporates the idea that if you just give data from the dominant search engine to rival search engines, they can just supplant uh, the currently dominant search engine, which for in the European Union is Google. Uh, I don't believe that, that that will happen or can happen. Um, then there is another type potentially of contestability, and that's the one I was referring to more in the article, is contestability of new markets, new evolving markets, new emerging niche markets. So what worries me 
the most where the DMA is actually, or with digital markets and which should be attacked by the DMA is the fact that in the many new markets, digital markets are evolving very quickly. New markets are evolving, new services are evolving. But in the past, we've seen much of the same companies conquering and mastering and being the incumbents then in these new emerging markets as well. And for me, a striving digital market is one where uh, new services are coming up and there's new players associated with these new services that come to the top. And so contestability of these new niche markets, emerging markets, that should be the ultimate goal for me of the DMA and not so much supplanting incumbents in the existing markets that they're in because they're transitory in some sense uh, because digital markets are evolving so quickly. Thank you, Jan. Chris, you, you come to these issues from the in industry perspective and you have experience with, with actually uh, working for, uh, for, for a company which is related to the search engine uh, in, in a sense, uh, industry. But now you are dealing uh, with, with more niche, more articulated product, which would be very relevant supposedly for the uh, compliance with the DMA and for we will discuss this in detail uh, at later stage, but what would be your kind of sectoral perspective about the, what do we want to achieve with this tool? Thanks, and let me first start by saying that I agree with everything Natalia and Jan says, so Alyssa, you're gonna have to work to make sure this isn't a boring panel where we agree with each other too much. Um, I will never forget asking a question at an event last fall about the DMA, in which I framed it as a competition law, and the start of the response that I got back was that the DMA is not a competition law. So that may have been before DG Connect and DG Comp worked out this sort of partnership that they have now. There may have been political things underneath that. But I do think at the very least, it's important not to think about the DMA as an antitrust law, because it's not. It's something different. It's something meant to sort of propose good outcomes here. And while I have worked uh, at Mozilla, which is a, 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 a sort of an industry player, though also a nonprofit at the top, so a little bit of an outlier, I would say I come mostly from a public interest advocacy background. And wearing that hat, I want uh, or I look for in the outcomes of the DMA, many of the same things that Natalia and Jan said, but with different labels. So on the sort of innovation and new entrance point, um, I, I very much agree that the, the sort of goal here is preserving what, what uh, Harvard professor Jonathan Zittrain calls the generativity of the internet, the ability of new entrants to come up with new ideas and succeed with those ideas and develop and identify new value in the connections that we have built in the internet. Um, but the more important part for me that hasn't been raised yet is whether as a result of the DMA, European users feel more free. I think that part of the impetus motivating this law is the belief that users feel trapped. And, and I think many users do feel trapped. And I think many of the things that my organization the Data Transfer Initiative is trying to build directly target that. How can we help users more freely move their data in particular around from service to service with the idea of feeling more empowered. And from that, you get an alignment of regulatory and market forces to lead to good outcomes. Thank you. Thank you very much, uh, Chris, for this. And if, if I may just a follow up question, uh, speaking a little bit about geometry, maybe, uh, which aspect of, of, of DMA competition uh, would be the most important, more, maybe, uh, are we talking about vertical competition? Are we talking about uh, this new products, new innovation imagined within within entrenched and quasi-public utility acknowledged as inevitable core platform services? Or are we talking about more horizontal entries? And if you're talking about horizontal entries, are we talking about entries coming from other e ecosystem who just want to expand, creating this on one, uh, from one side, it would be quite healthy, competitive dynamics. On the other hand, it would be even somehow elite league with no possibility to 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 enter for for the outsider. What would be your views on 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 this perspective? Well, I certainly think the idea of an elite league is what we're trying to to prevent here, right? To keep from being the 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 future situation for the internet as we see it. I will push back on any attempt to pick a favorite between vertical or horizontal in this space. I think that since my focus is on user empowerment and how users can move their data, it applies equally to both. So the, the Article 6.9, the, the user data portability provisions of the DMA, 
equally empower a user to move their data to a service that offers something very much like what they have today and where their data has been contributed in the past and where activity that they have done has been measured and is available for them to transfer and to independent third party different things that can extract additional value from that same data. So for me, it's not something that I can make a decision between. I think we have the tools within the DMA to promote both, I think, very effectively. Thank you, Chris. And if I can expand this question to Natalia and Jan as well. As well Natalia, please. Yes, yeah, so I, I, first I will agree and then I will try to disagree for the sake of, uh, of a vibrant discussion. So I will agree that I also wouldn't pick between vertical and horizontal. And I think the DMA, there's also no clear, no clear choice because some obligations seem to promote what I've termed in some pay in a paper I recently co-authored, uh, intra-platform competition. It's a very common term. No, some some focus on competition within the platform, others uh, inter-platform between platforms, other even as as I think what Chris uh, was relating to, uh, extra platform. So it's it's kind of related to a platform, not not quite like Amazon and and the distribution services, right? It's it's not really the core platform service, but it's very related to. Um, so we have different obligations focusing on on different aspects of these. Some even on both. Uh, like the data portability, ob portability obligation can go in both ways. Um, so for me, it's hard to see which of these dimensions of competition the DMA then prioritizes, but there is a clear choice being made not to prioritize inter-gatekeeper uh, competition, so two gatekeepers going against each other, but um, also because we want to avoid this elite club of gatekeepers uh, just competing with each other in every possible segment and every possible market. Um, but what if in a market, there's a gate, it's a gate kept market by gate, gate kept by one gatekeeper. And then perhaps the only or, or the best possible way to bring some competition in there is through another gatekeeper. And the DMA there doesn't seem to doesn't seem to acknowledge this, not even as a possible except except exception, for example, that tying might be allowed if it is to to disrupt a, a, another gatekeeper. So you know, Apple versus Facebook or or Facebook versus Amazon, something like this. Um, but in some scenarios, it might be plausible that the strongest potential competitor is, is an already existing gatekeeper, but a gatekeeper for something else. Um, so that's the part where I try to bring in some discussion. Perhaps uh, there is some room for competition by or entrance by, by a gatekeeper. Yeah, and what will be your view? Actually, I think, I think DMA is quite neutral about, about not, not somehow diminishing this, this not toxic, but problematic dimension of competition. What, what, how would you see this? No, I, I would agree. It's, uh, um, it, it's also a tricky question. I mean, gatekeepers, with all the discussions about them, they are also innovators. They are great innovators as well. And uh, to prevent them from competing or to stepping into markets would also not be good. So um, what is important and what is the role of the DMA is, I guess, to keep markets open more generally, both horizontally and vertically. And indeed, many of the gatekeepers of today have entered somewhere in a vertical value chain uh, and from there conquered other parts of the value chain. So Google started in search and then it ventured into uh, mobile operating systems, app stores, and so on, and now is controlling sort of a whole mobile ecosystem in a sense through that. Um, Apple started from the hardware layer, basically, and ventured into it's venturing more into services up to the point where it's now trying to compete with Apple in advertising services eventually. Um, so we see that even the and Facebook, of course, started in social media, and and so they're moving up and down the value chain. I think that is a very powerful entry mode. Uh, coming back to my earlier point, where you find a niche, you conquer that niche, and from that niche, you go up and down the value chain and, and grow in some size, and then maybe potentially also make some horizontal competition to some of the existing gatekeepers. Uh, but keeping markets open and also having to compete against the incumbents actually is a powerful driver of competition and innovation for the third parties. We just need to make sure that that competition occurs on a more or less uh, level playing field, which is difficult enough, and the DMA cannot you can never fully rectify the, the 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 playing field as being level but we can at least move towards that dimension a little bit and i think the dma is making a good progress in that regard i don't know if it's the end of the story i don't know if it's the it's the best possible law we could have come up with but at least we have to give it to european commission that they have come up with a law that is uh, not uh, totally erratic and is moving in the right direction 
Thank you. Thank you very much. Let, after we somehow learned about your normative positions in terms of the mission of the DMA, I propose we revert to more, more to, to the technical part of, of the conversation related to the to the workshop itself. And if I might ask you, Natalia, you are known in our cycles as as having this remarkable ability to map uh, in very digestible, approachable, but still very very you know didactically uh, mature way all these kind of technicalities in in, in very user-friendly fashion. So if, I, if you can provide us with a kind of background uh, about the workshop, what are the main topics, what are the main articles of the DMA of oblig obligations which have been discussed uh, last yeah, Friday? Yes, I love, I love a good summary. So uh, for me, what, what stood out um, was first of all, the, the focus on, on user experience and user empowerment and uh, how everyone agreed that much of the DMA success will will lie in how gatekeepers present their their compliance solutions um, to users. So in how they design consent flows, consent moments, how this is presented to users, whether it will be experienced as a burden. You know what we've seen with the GDPR, the consent fatigue that was also mentioned a lot in the in the room. I think. Um, this we want to avoid this this consent fiasco so we want uh the user experience to be at the at the center and then i think another theme was metrics which you also mentioned before you know how to know if the dma is performing successfully we need some ideas of the goals behind the dma and we also need to agree on what the goals are and then we also need to kind of see but, but the key issue here seems to be a bit the unpredictability of competition and innovation in these space so then that makes it difficult to come with come with a concrete uh, indicator and also a metric for how to know if a gatekeeper is complying and that I think ties into another theme of the of the workshop what which was information asymmetries uh, the gatekeepers know much better what what's going on sometimes they claim they, they have no idea what's going on with their data but uh, how to know as a regulator that that the information on a process that a, that a gatekeeper provides is actually accurate and then a very interesting theme was um, that the DMA can be a business opportunity for gatekeepers to innovate, as uh, as Jan said, but also for third parties uh, to to innovate and come up with solutions. And then there were also the I, what I see as the classic classic legal questions: how to interpret some of the undefined terms. Uh, this comes with every piece of legislation, and I think we shouldn't. Uh, bring these up as, as critiques of, of the DMA per se, you know, they cannot define every single word in, in detail. And then the, the interplay between the DMA and other instruments, the elephant in the room is the GDPR, of course, and and the, the technicalities and details of, of the governance system. How are we going to do this in, in practice? Um, that was another, another key theme. Excellent. Uh, Chris, you participated in this uh, uh, in this event in the fourth in the fourth uh, stakeholder workshop in 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 very vibrant panel, I should note. Uh, but what was your impression? Do you think this this uh, this mechanism is helpful overall? And more specifically, did you find some discussions more relevant and more promising than than others? I mean, of course, I am biased in favor of my own panel, but. Uh, even apart from from that and my excellent uh, co-interlocutors on that panel, I think the data access provisions of the DMA are really the bright spot that shows us that sort of innovation and market potential that the DMA can offer and that help us keep that focus on user empowerment at which the DMA is its strongest. Uh, other sessions in the panel, I was there for the whole day, really brought that elephant to the room a little bit more in the sense of the GDPR and the compliance obligations as well. I don't think we've yet mentioned the Data Act, but as it makes its way through Trilog, we must consider that as well, particularly the provisions of the Data Act that speak directly to this idea of transferring data between gatekeeper services, as there is a prohibition on that in some circumstances, which certainly from my perspective, I regard as quite anti-user empowerment and, and, uh, and intent. Um, so the 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 ultimate takeaway from the workshop for me was it depends in classic lawyer fashion because there are still so many pieces left to be worked out but it is clear that the potential for for very good things can be there and and for for transformation of the way that users experience the internet ecosystem uh, for the better thank you chris Jan, you participated in previous one of the previous workshops and you also publish a lot on on these topics how do you evaluate the outcomes of the fourth one well, it's, of course, difficult to evaluate the outcomes uh, of, of something that just recently happened, and that's uh, part of ongoing discussions. 
Um, I generally, I, I do find the workshops both useful and useless uh, at the same time, I have to say. Uh, so of course, it's very useful to actually have a wider discussion about some of the implementation issues that come along with the um, with the DMA, and these are tremendous. I mean, there are big questions left on the table still um, that uh, also in the legislative process, which was quite quick actually, and a lot of time has been spent in the process on designation of gatekeepers, but very little time has actually been spent on evaluating and in detail looking at the, what do we have, 22 obligations um, on gatekeepers. And each one of them is uh, both, I guess, from a legal, economic and technical perspective, very challenging and uh, there has been quite little discussion about this up to the point where uh, for some of these obligations there's also no no not enough research actually to go to go uh, on with this and interoperability of messenger service for example like computer scientists are realizing now what mess sort of the the, the legal people have created here you know for for the technical part well um but at the same so i mean it's very useful to have that discussion and to also show the different trade-offs and the very difficult trade-offs being involved and then at the same time because this is a public discussion um, and also having worked on this a lot, uh, the, the devil is as always in the detail and you can only really go into implementation issues and really resolve these if you're really working with the firms and the specific platform services, the specific core platform services in question, uh, and given the, the infrastructure they have in place. I think there is um, there's not much more we can debate publicly in general on, on, on these provisions. The next step is really going in a 101 with the companies, which the commission is doing, but that's not happening at the workshops, of course. Could I build on that a, a little bit? I, I, uh, I want to note the, the clock that's ticking as far as measuring the impact of the DMA is concerned, which is the elections next year, right? As the elections uh, wrap up, as the new commission mandate starts to kick off, there will be an evaluation process, and a large component of that will be to look and see how has the DMA fared so far. And with the obligations sort of kicking off only in March of next year, it's a very, very short window to try to evaluate and gauge what has happened and, and what should be teed up for the next five years as a result of what has happened thus far. It's one of the reasons why this metrics conversation is so important, and I want to bring us back to that briefly, although I know that we have many other really good things to talk about, and I'm very eager to talk about what continuous and real-time means, and as I know Jan does as well. Uh, but on this metrics question, if we are looking in December of 2024 at market shares and whether those have changed as a result of the DMA, it's going to be meaningless. Any shift in market shares on such a timetable will, will be reflective of other dynamics and forces, not implementation practices that have been put in place as a consequence of this law. There will be things that will have changed, but the echoes will, will not be useful. I also want to argue that normatively, that is the wrong lens to look at. The DMA is not meant to force users to change services whether they want to or not, but rather to give them the power to do so, to create this opportunity for new investment and new opportunity and new competitors to show that they have value that makes it worth it for users to switch. So one thing that could be better instead are user surveys or some other sort of instrument that runs around and whether users see a change, whether users see that they have new tools like what I'm building selfishly, but other things available to them to help them feel like the market is better for them and that they don't feel quite as trapped. Okay, let us pause on this point, Chris. And um, we have two kind of reasons why, why more kind of paternalistic understanding of the DMA that we try to somehow design uh, digital markets in, in a more accessible fashion uh, and make uh, most or many business users benefiting from them. And more pragmatic vision is somehow we enable an opportunity, but only handful, most informed, most skillful business users would be able to operationalize these new opportunities. And it's somehow incentives are of opportunities are there, that, but incentives must come from business users themselves. Natalia, do you see this different kind of um, centers of gravity and which one, if you do, which one would you consider to be more reliable and more accurate and more normatively yeah. adjustable, uh, preferable? 
So what um, Chris just said, I think is very important because we have just this very short window of time to kind of see, okay, the DMA is here and has done some things, but what do we think about it? And I think we won't see any shifts in market shares, definitely not, definitely not uh, any shifts that we can attribute attribute with confidence to the, to the DMA. Um, but what we will see, I think almost immediately is these consent, um, these consent screens popping up um, that will, especially because of 5.2, uh, that will require user consent for the, uh, unless the gatekeepers implement big changes to how they process data and combine data and cross use data. And I think from the signals that we got from the workshops, uh, I don't think that gatekeepers are focusing on changing that, but rather on designing the consent moment. Um, so I think it's very important that that this is done in a way that users don't experience any any major inconvenience, or for example, that data portability is is kind of a, a seamless experience that you just you know one service to another, and that you don't really have to think about the technicalities of it. Ideally, that happens behind uh, behind the scenes, and you don't have to think about it. Um, so it's crucial that this is done well. And then what you mentioned about the different different business users. I think of obligation, the one on not using the data of business users, I think it's 6-2. And I think how will business users even be aware that this obligation exists? So I think there's a very big role to play there, probably by the commission, because I don't think gatekeepers really have the incentives to inform their business users too much about the existence of such obligations. Um, but how will they even know that this exists? And and if their data is being used, how will they even know that this is the case? And if they suspect it, how will they even prove that that it's their specific data that it is being used and that there's does a breach of of this obligation, the DMA that they could uh, and that this obligation exists that they could possibly benefit from? So I think some um, information efforts to to inform uh, users and users and both business users uh, will be helpful in in somehow shaping the early early successes of the DMA. This probably leads us to the panel chaired by Giorgio Monti when they were discussing this issue. You can't use data of a business user in competition with this business user. But if you have 1,000 business users, can you just cross fertilize and use other business user data in competition with user B, A and user business user B data in competition with user business user A, et cetera? And how do you understand these dynamics? Do you, do you think it's even, do, do, we, do we have to be more moderate and more cynical with our expectations of, of converting the very nature of the digital markets, trying to focus on more pragmatically on more targeted issues? Or do you think it's doable actually? It's a hard job, but it's doable. Yes, uh, the, the DMA has different provisions that some of them are more, let's say a moral code book, and some of them are more enforceable. You know? And um, for example, the prohibition of self-preferencing, I think it's useful to have it in there. It's totally not enforceable, really, because you can do self-preferencing in, in so many intricate ways, so subtly, so subtle ways that um, uh, still, it's good to be there as a moral compass. No. Um, and similar in a similar way, it, it's also with 6.2. Of course, you should, the, the purpose of a platform is to be an intermediator between the business users and those seeking access to the business users. And you need to derive data from the business users and how users are interacting with them to fulfill that intermediation process to the best extent. Now, where does it go into being in competition with them? And uh, that's, that's a fine line to be crossed. Clearly, if you take the data and see, hey, and this is where the, this particular provision is coming from, hey, this is a cool product being sold on my platform, and I want to, I see that uh, there, because I'm the platform, I see where the product has been sourced from, I might even be shipping that product on the behalf of the business user, and I have the ability also in combination with a self-preferencing to steer consumers to my product in the future instead of to the product of the business user, which who has, however, uh, taken the, the entrepreneurial risk to actually come up with the product and to make a market for it in a sense, then of course it's a breach of, of, of 6.2. And, uh, but again, it's a fine line. How enforceable is it really? It's gonna be difficult at, with all the data related obligations, uh, especially also the data siloing the 5.2. Uh, you can train your model using the data and then throw away the data and you can keep the trained model and say, hey, 
I don't have the data. They are still in the silos. And who will ever know that you used, you know, that some of the weights of your deep neural network have been adjusted because of the data that you used. And the same goes with 6.2. Um, and yet, as a moral compass, I think it's, it's good to have it. Let me shift this question to Chris. Chris, leaving aside, not, not talking yet about the 6.9, 6.10, uh, uh, staying within 6.2 and 5.2, do you think such issues as consent, uh, some co colleagues like Damian Jaradin laughs openly about the, 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 the expectation from, from consent and how you can design choice architecture using all these behavioral skills and AI skills as well uh, to make it seamless and you just say okay automatically because your life is too, too, too expensive to, to waste it on, on these things. And uh, compliance overall and maybe uh, more, more specifically to Article 6.2. Let me also add a point of contextual observation as the American in the panel. Our laws in the United States tend to be what I describe as underspecified. Every single piece that can be used as a lever in some form of litigation or legal action will be exploited to the nth degree by the nature of the system that we have built here in the United States. Um, that characteristic I do not see in the same way in the European Union. So an EU law like the DMA has incentives to be quite broad, even recognizing that not every provision in it is going to be enforced or implemented at the same time or to the same level of rigor. And that is a feature, not a bug, I would argue. So I think that we can't um, view this from a pessimistic lens and say, unless every piece is actually fully understood and fully implemented into practice, the law is a failure. That's not, that's not a, a fair assessment. Um, I, I, in uh, other words, I often say I respect and appreciate the European Union's efforts to pass a law like the DMA and not let the perfect be the enemy of the good. If you wait so long as to work out every detail of something this comprehensive, you will never pass it. So I think that I, I appreciate that we will be able to sort of implement and enforce some provisions of this sooner rather than others and achieve benefit from it sooner rather than later. I think that Article 5.2 and Natalia's point about consent flows is, is the one where we're going to probably see the most immediate understanding of whether the law was written right and, and how its interpretation is developing in practice. So I do think that we have a very practical opportunity there to have a conversation about what effective consent flow looks like and how we can make sure that it doesn't interfere with user intent and user comfort and user freedoms in a practical way. It's one of the greatest lessons we have from the GDPR. Let me ask Natalia and Jan, do you want to reflect on, on enforceability? So I think, again, with the timeline in mind, I think, uh, especially in the beginning, the, the priority will be on, on the, on the low-hanging fruit, so to say, on the, on the easy cases. For example, self-preferencing, I know it was not one of the data-related obligations, but uh, they will focus on where it's, you know, it's very clear that a, that a gatekeeper is. If Amazon's product always ranks first, you know, that's easy. Then, of course, there are more nuanced ways and intricate ways to do that are very difficult to prove that it's actually, you know, deliberate self-preferencing. Um, but those we, I think we won't see at the, at the beginning. And also, I think it's important for the DMA to somehow kickstart its enforcement period to, to have these successes, you know, the, and also the consent flows to be properly designed. That's a success of, of the DMA if that happens in a satisfactory way. So I think the focus will lie on there. I just want to add one thing on, um, on enforceability, which is um, 5.2, for example, is there precisely because it's not a new thing, actually, in a sense, because it's already been in place under GDPR, technically, that you need to get the consent per service. Uh, but because it has been under enforced uh, under the GDPR and uh, under the one stop shop principle, um, that uh, in this case, the Irish um, Data Protection Authority was just, it's just being overwhelmed with enforceability. Now we're moving it to the level of the European Union in the hope that they have more teeth and uh, are better in enforcing, but then they have 22 obligations on their plate times you know, certain number of gatekeepers uh, who just happen to be the most powerful uh, firms uh, on earth. And um, so this is, this is quite a lot to tackle. And then I think uh, you, you can't, I think in a legal sense do that, but practically I think you have to pick your wars, you know, <laughs> out of all the obligations there are. Um, and I don't know if 5-2 is a good battleground. Oh, look, I'm, I'm certainly in agreement. And, and I also reflect on the conversation that we had in the panel around 5-2 and 
the consensus of several of us that while this was not an unresolved problem, it was also less novel than many of the other things that we're talking about in the context of the DMA. So that goes straight to your, to your point, Jan, and, and, and uh, Jan Penfrat made a similar comment at the very end. These are hard problems, but they are not new problems. And I fully agree that if, if the focus becomes immediately on enforcement of 5.2, things are going to get messy quickly and we'll, we'll find ourselves in many of the same complex pickles that, that we've been in for many years. That said, I also agree that will be the first visible sign of implementation. So we have a sort of a, of a tension point that's on the horizon for implementation of the DMA and how we evaluate that implementation, where the most visible thing to users which will be these change consent flows is also the thing that I think we pretty much agree enforcement of in the immediate term is not going to be the most fruitful nor the most productive in terms of encouraging concrete novel outcomes and changes as a consequence of this law. So I don't have an answer to that to that dilemma, but I think it's one that the commission I hope is very well aware of. I know we have to move to obligations 6.9 and 6.10, but I am very tempted to, to pause a little bit here and ask your views. Okay, if we, if we acknowledge that there are two kind of, it appears that there, there could be two mm, generic answers to this. One is let's let's do it gradually and even, even moral imperatives are, uh, are important. And even if we deliver some results to the markets, it's important. That would be more kind of, um, making the world a better place narrative and another one would be more cynical probably and saying these these obligations are never designed to be in, in force, enforceable in their totality it's more a toolkit which increases the, the 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 voice of the enforcer enable them to focus on issues which are uh, most important and most detrimental or most de decisive for shaping digital markets and these are discretionary they are not possible to envisage a uh, in the legislation itself, it's a matter of policy choices. So we give them a tool, a, a stick, which is uh, which has to be applied prudently uh, to 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 different ad hoc situations. So which one, in your view, which which two simplifying narratives, in your view, appear to be more more realistic and more applicable in in real life? If I can start with Natalia. So. On the one hand, you had the sort of very cynical one. This is never meant to be right. The obligations can never be applied in their totality. And the other one was the the what was the other view again? Well, it's not very enforceable, but uh, let's do it gradually, step that's by step. It's better than nothing. As we have. So I think, I mean, somewhere in the middle. I think we have to be very thinking of it as just a moral toolkit. That's not enough because then you end up not really enforcing any of the obligations really, and then gatekeepers can just you know in the extreme just ignore the dma and continue doing what they've been doing so far um but i i do think that we that we can be pragmatic about it you know take an obligation and there will be fringe cases where it is very difficult to to determine whether whether the dma applies or not whether gatekeeper is liable or not but but there are also easy cases i think that that the commission can take on and and this is what we also see in in competition on antitrust priority setting and uh, I think we'll also see that under the DMA. And uh, I think also the obligations that made it into the DMA are probably a product of some sort of priority setting. It didn't, some things are not in the DMA and other things are. And in that sense, the DMA already cast a quite broad net of, of obligations. So there will be obligations that for now will be a bit ignored or under, under enforced, but perhaps in the future, they, these will become very important. So it's, so it's important that they're in there and, and I welcome that. But so I think I'm somewhere in the middle uh, between these two views. Maybe if I can, it can come in on that, because uh, first, I don't want to be misunderstood in saying that the DMA is just the moral compass. Uh, I think, as I said, some obligations are more in that vicinity and, and others are different. If you think about most favored nation clauses, uh, that is readily enforceable and readily observable, for example, right? So, um, and then there's other things that, you know, are more difficult to enforce. And as I understand, I'm, you know, I'm not a legal scholar, but there's also private enforcement possible. So um, there's even, you know, it's more than just what the commission does. Um, but I think the biggest, the biggest critique, I would say, of the DMA is that it's not been designed from the ground up in a very coherent way. It's been designed or it's it's come into existence as basically a wish list of the different competition authorities or the European Commission handling different cases uh, in, in that context. And this is how, how we have that list. And it's basically um, a, a path dependent 
historical coincidence that it's exactly that list of, of services. And it's not been designed really with a strong regulatory idea from the ground up. And uh, so this is why it looks a lot like a patchwork. And this is also why there is so much difference in enforceability and level of detail in which, which uh, obligations apply to which core platform services and so on. And um, so maybe, but still, I mean, we do have the law now. We could have also deliberated about this for another decade, and then the market would have uh, manifested even more. Um, so there is a trade-off, of course, in speed and enforceability in being concrete. And this is also a trade-off that the DMA has very deliberately made in being very specific on some things, and uh, but also uh, not covering everything, having the possibility to potentially add core platform services in the future is not so clear how we can add obligations or whether we can actually take out core platform services as well in the future. But um, yes, I mean, there, there is a clear preference for speed, both in the legislative process and also in sort of in the, in the enforcement possibilities of this. And that comes with a trade-off. Um, just to add on to that, uh, again, in alignment with, with what my fellow speakers are saying, let me draw out the values of clarity and communication in this context. So again, I will make a comparison to the American legal backdrop here, where a lot of antitrust law is uh, interpretations over many decades by many courts of a few short words, uh, not to not to uh, not to conspire together, not to act in, in a monopolistic fashion. So we've had very very little clarity about what in practice is expected in order to meet those standards, and built that up with various theories of enforcement in our court systems over time. I am uh, fond of a saying in American antitrust law that I expect is equally applicable in European, though I'm not a European antitrust lawyer by any stretch of the imagination. And that saying is that theories of enforcement uh, never actually get overturned in the law. They just sort of go in and out of fashion. And I expect that we may see the same in the future with, with this, like un understandings of what is expected will never be entirely written down. There will always be more power latent in the law than is than is brought to bear in practice. And and it's it's complicated and it's confusing and it can undermine certainty, but you know, we've lived within an antitrust for so long. The importance is clarity of expectations, right? So in, in this exercise, I regard what the DMA is doing is as operating within that broader framework of, we want you to be good actors within a market ecosystem. Here are some indications of what we believe being a good actor looks like. So as long as there is subsequent clarity regarding which of those are going to be most viewed, most enforced, most on the table in the near term, I think it's a, it's a framework that can be worked with. It just can't be an unrealistic, yes, everything all the time right now, because then you, you are left in an unworkable place. Um, and the outcome, I think, is going to be frustrating. So communication is the second point, right? This is what I said. If, if, if there is a dialogue between the regulator and outside experts, including the companies, but also including economists and think tanks and academic scholars and so forth about what to focus on and what the near-term goals should be from an enforcement and an implementation perspective, I think we can work these things out, despite the lack of coherent theory in this law, which of course I fully agree with, and despite the difficulty of measuring and enforcing some of the provisions in it. Thank you very much, Chris. Uh, let us refer to some of these issues a little bit later, but now let, I propose we look at this third panel uh, at the DMA stakeholder workshop, namely obligations of Article 6, 9, and 6, 10. They didn't address, Jan, you have noticed it, they didn't address the obligation of Article 611, which appears to be the most powerful potentially. Maybe they will have a separate workshop on it. Maybe we won't reflect upon this later. But let us start with Natalia. Maybe Natalia, you can you can again use, we can again use your, your uh, uh, ability to summarize so vividly uh, uh, all, all these complexities and explain to us what is at stake, what were at stake in, the, in these workshops and in these obligations themselves. The 6 9 and 6 10 it gets very technical, but it revolves around a, a lot around the technicalities of, of with data portability, how this is going to be done, and also which actors will be at the center there. And I thought it was very striking that uh, Google, for example, was, was kind of teasing one of the um, implementation solutions that they were working on, and this still had Google at the center of it. So it was Google in charge of this data portability experience, but then with uh, Chris's intervention, you saw that this can also be done very differently with not the gatekeeper at the center, but a third party. And then perhaps that's the preferable solution, no? where that we are able to do things uh, that more things than Google would allow us to do with their uh, with their curated experience. 
Um, so I thought that was that was interesting uh, to see. And um, what always struck me, what always strikes me when looking at six nine and six ten is a bit the absence of uh, the security and privacy language that you see in other obligations. It, this strikes me with the DMA in general that some obligations do make do acknowledge that these risks exist or that the gatekeeper could make some that some provision could be made for for uh, privacy or security considerations to be taken into account by the gatekeeper uh, to somehow diminish a bit the force of the obligation. Uh, but this is this is absent from six nine and six ten. But with data portability, I can think of privacy considerations. And uh, not to say that this then means that we should uh, forget about data portability, the privacy risks are too big. They seem very manageable, but it's strange that the language is not there in the, in the, um, in the text of the DMA itself. But then in the workshop, this was mentioned here and there. So it does seem that the commission will, will be open to these type of, type of arguments. Thank you, Natalia. Jan, can you develop on that? Yes, um, so maybe on, on this privacy related <laughs> or security privacy related point. Uh, it is of course an obligation that stems from the GDPR privacy law and uh, you are all, each user has to consent to his or her data being ported somewhere. Um, so in that regard, there is a safeguard already and it's a little bit different to the other obligations which you refer to on interoperability, for example, uh, or, or virtually open inter where the user doesn't really have a say directly in whether or not an interface is opened up, it's opened up for competition. So I think there is a structural difference and um, there, it's, it's in that regard also taken care of and it would be a little bit strange to uh, have privacy related concerns to something that comes out of a privacy regulation originally in a sense. Um, now, 6.9 and 6.10 are, of course, I mean, 6.9 particularly is, of course, sort of a, a data portability GDPR style Article 20 2.0. Um, and um, I've also argued strongly for a continuous real-time um, data portability being amended uh, to what we already have as a right under GDPR, uh, because there are several shortcomings with the, the Article 20. Um, which has in practice, and there's a lack of empirical papers there they're slowly emerging, but it has not been very successful, to be honest. So there is, I don't know how many services you know that actually accepts data that has been exported from somewhere else to import somewhere. And uh, if you ever exercise the data portability request by one of these, uh, one of these services, um, you get a mess of data back. Uh, so these are zip files or JSON files and uh, different collection of things. And um, so it's not, it's not very, yes, it says and the GPS has to be structured format, but that can actually mean anything. So the advantage of this is uh, different things. First, um, of course, data portability, and that's the main idea, should facilitate switching. And uh, that taps into a very traditional also economic literature on uh, the presence of competition or competition in the presence of, of, of switching costs, uh, which says that the more switching costs there are, the less uh, strong is the, is the competition. So that is, I think, the, the strongest rationale for this. But then if you actually want to switch a service, you usually don't wait for 30 days before you get the data. You want to switch right away. And this is where sort of an immediate switching possibility, immediate data portability comes in already here and the need for it to be, uh, let's say, very quick. You know? And one way of doing that is to provide an interface whereby you can just get the data and, and switch immediately. Another thing is that you can also facilitate multi-homing with this. Usually you don't really switch for good from one service to another, but you might be using two services in parallel for some time, and uh, but you're, you're still generating data on each of the two services. And then for that, you need to sync the services maybe somehow, not in an interoperable fashion in the narrow sense, but maybe let's say you use two music streaming services concurrently and you like songs here and you like songs there, and you want the other service to know what songs you've liked on, on each of the services and for that you need sort of a syncing of, of some data that could also be facilitated by this data portability um, and then that's a point that um, that Chris also mentioned before is that if we believe data is useful for innovation um, then we should free data from from the silos in its in not necessarily only for switching to another comparable service but maybe for taking the data to a completely new service that does something different with it, or uh, actually maybe even selling my data to on, on, on markets for others to, to use it, 
um, to develop services. That's also very much the idea of the Data Act that, that you mentioned before, Chris, where uh, it's the same idea of this data taken out of the silos and innovation occurring more decentralized rather than centralized with the incumbent. And there also a, a continuous data portability, I guess, is useful. Um, and in that sense, it's also, I guess, the re prerequisite for the emergence of so-called personal information management systems, where uh, you have basically a tool, a software that is sort of a central dashboard where you can give consent, revoke consent, manage your data flows ingoing and outgoing of different services and potentially also a place where you can sell the data. Um, and there's a lots of, I think there's lots of difficulties with that in practice and it's still a vision very much for the long term, but uh, it's not too late to start and to pave the way for that and the DMA already now. And um, yeah, and then ultimately the 610 data portability for business users is uh, recognizing that business users are a lot, a lot of, in a lot of ways similar to actually consumers in the platforms. They also don't have the, the similar market power um, and they also want to multi-home on different platforms, use the data for different um, purposes. And therefore it's, I think also useful to um, have the 610 on top of the 69, although it gets a little bit more complicated and messy uh, because then it's not so clear who is actually a consumer of that business user. Uh, a lot of times, uh, and what is engagement of the consumer with a business user? If you're just seeing a search results list and your company is listed there, have you already engaged with that company or not by making a choice not to click on that link of that user? or by choosing not to buy. It's also basically an engagement. You might've been considered, but you know, and so it's it's getting more difficult, but again, I'm I'm very much in favor of 6.9 and 6.10 in general. Absolutely, and thank you. And Natalia, I would say, set me up for this as well. So I run the Data Transfer Initiative for anyone who didn't w watch the video of the panel where I talked about it a little bit more. And the, the purpose of my nonprofit is to build tooling to connect data portability interfaces directly so that users don't have to download their data, try to navigate any differences in format or structure and how it is used in one platform versus another, but to do that translation and that porting for them in the back end, which we think can really increase in the, the user's experience with data portability offerings and interfaces. We have to recognize that data portability's origins are um, more drawn from the privacy world than from the competition world. So from that perspective, it's enough to download a copy of your data in whatever format it's stored in on the host platform, and then you have it and you are free to do what you will with it. And that is indeed empowering, but, but only for users who, who are more technically skilled or who are interested in, in tinkering with that and customizing and adapting it. For, for most people, that's not valuable to them, and data portability does not become valuable until you have things like what the Data Transfer Initiative is doing that will move it to another place and another service for them. So... I am uh, excited about and, and deeply invested in Article 6.9 in large part because of the continuous and real-time language in that provision. Now that is going to change things. It's going to change a lot of things because modern data portability APIs are, are bulk and they are what I call stateless, which means that you initiate the data portability request. It goes to the platform and says, hey, first time caller, you know, long time caller, first time listener, that sort of thing. You, I got that reversed, forgive me. Um, give me all of my data. And so then it initiates a, a complex process at the back end to collect all of that data and transmit it. And in the future, these portability transfers will need to have some signal of state, whether it is kept at the host that remembers what it has sent to whom, or whether it's kept at the recipient that says, hey, I know what I have, I need data after X date in order to, to make this happen. And, and the, the central focus of my intervention at the workshop last week, and the central point I want to leave here, is that this is a technically challenging but possible thing to do. And from a sort of a practical perspective, it's my recommendation that the commission not try to make technical judgments for how it is to be implemented, but leave some amount of flexibility to be contextually variable and specific and, and tailored in how to achieve the goals well articulated in the law in individual circumstances. If I could add one quick point uh, in response to Natalia's as well, we saw Google's sort of efforts to, to show their compliance with this law at the workshop last week. I certainly prefer what we do as a means of sort of directly transferring the data. However, we cannot be in compliance with the law on behalf of the companies. So they have to sort of figure out how to do what they uh, view as necessary compliance if we disappear. For, 
turn the face of the earth tomorrow. And so this is this weird dynamic that we're in where they have to be individually in compliance. Yet it's, I think, preferable for them and for us to have more things like what we do. And so we just have to live in that world where we have all of these options and hey, more options for users is hardly a bad thing. Thank you, Chris. I, I, I wanted to ask you, Natalia, and you, Jan, to reflect upon the, okay, we, we assume that based on what Chris just presented, we, we, we can have a user-friendly uh, uh, toolkit to, 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 do, to engage in, in data portability. But do, do you think many, you, or should we rely on the quantity of users who will be using it? Is it something which, which is capable to change the market? Obviously, but when talking about obligation, we only open the door and then it's for the for the end users or business users in, in, in uh, 610 to use or not to use it. Do you think overall this, this mechanism is something which the market is uh, in need for, or it's something which we try to somehow to constrain the omnipotence and omnipresence of gatekeepers? This probably leads us to the previous question about the, the main apparatus which the, the, the DMA directorates will be, will be uh, applying and the main and guiding, guiding steering role which they consider or designate to themselves. Yes, yeah, so just thinking as a as an end user only, not even thinking about the business users, but I can come up with you know five services where I've had where I've wanted to to port in some instance something to another service, and then you Google it and you and it turns out there's a whole forum on it, and and there's so many users that also want to for you know whether it's a certain type of file or a certain type of service. I can think of it was also in the workshop, and, and I think someone said it was a bit silly, and we should focus on the business users, but the the playlists from from Apple Music to Spotify. I have not even necessarily because I want to use both, but. Um, I used to use Apple Music a lot, whereas Spotify tends to be more more popular, at least in my circles. And then to share a playlist, this was just not possible. I think now there might be some third party uh, solutions to that, but at least a few years ago, I couldn't find an, an easy way to do that. And then there's also to share, you know, annotations on documents from from one uh, word processing file to another. Right now, you can forget about that. At least if for me, who doesn't have too much technical expertise. And I already consider myself someone who, my friends call me the digital native just because I know which HDMI cable to order on Amazon for a certain device, right? So um, so the, the differences in, in technical levels are, are, are will also determine how much data portability a user will want. Um, but I think there's there's a market for that, and, and I'm sure that in for business users even even more even to to a greater extent there there's a there's a hunger for for data portability solutions. I have to jump in here quickly just to say that we are working on a data transfer initiative powered music playlist transfer tool. So more solutions I think are coming for that and and for things like that that are um, front of mind for users. Just wanted to interject with that. Yeah, maybe maybe I can add two things on this. Um, uh, the first is that, of course, the DMA relies on a lot of instances on actually educated or well-informed consumers, and ultimately, competition can only come from the consumer end. So if if there's a great service out there and uh, consumers don't know about it or consumers don't switch for whatever reason, uh, and 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 being laziness, you know, one of the reasons, and not. Uh, so that that cannot so competition requires informed consumers um and it's of course on the market players on the one hand but i think it's also on the commission and regulators and governments to educate consumers about their rights and that is also the same with data portability already on the gdpr which i think many people on the street don't know that they have this right or can exercise this right um and uh, so there needs to be done much more on this um, and there is a second aspect actually that that worries me a little bit in 6.9 in terms of the language is that it says specifically that uh, gatekeepers ought to provide tools to facilitate the effective exercise of data portability. So my reading of that is actually that um, gatekeepers must not necessarily allow third-party tools to integrate with their services in order to allow for data portability. So the kinds of things that Chris talks about that, you know, there is a, there is a services software or third party um, um, tool that, that could potentially do the data portability for you from one service to another um, 
if, and that's an interpretation, of course, my interpretation of the DMA here is right, then it would suffice for Google to provide their own tool and say, here, here is a tool that gives you the data and that that's it. Yeah. Um, and that would actually crowd out in a sense because they wouldn't have an obligation to educate you about the variety of tools that might exist out there. Uh, it might also be that there's one tool per gatekeeper then instead of being you know, one tool that actually interacts with all the gatekeepers and, and, and acts as one of these personal information management systems I was alluding to before. Uh, so that I think should, should be avoided at any cost that uh, it's good that the gatekeeper provides maybe a tool but then we're back in the discussion of choice screens, of consumer choice. You know, how do you promote your tool as opposed to another tool? Because apparently, gatekeeper tools are probably not as versatile and not as you know consumer friendly uh, as as the ones that other third parties would provide. Um, because if that would be a thing that the gatekeeper would ultimately be interested in, they could already be doing it now, yeah, much more, and offering it now. Beyond's point is very good. I will note, of course, the language says, and third parties authorized by an end user, but it's an interesting point. What is the what is the conflux of this third parties authorized by an end user and including by providing tools? I would, I would hopefully lean on that including part and suggest that not only do they need to provide tools, but they also need to actually provide the data. Um, and, and in practice, that has been through automated means, notably application programming interfaces or APIs. It's certainly my expectation that those APIs will continue to be provided in order to allow for the creation of other tools, not simply the gatekeepers ones. And of course I have a self-interest in this because we are we are building uh, tools to facilitate just such use. So, but it's an important point to keep an eye on as, as implementation of this goes forward. And uh, Jan, if I, if I can revert back to the point which you have made earlier, uh, that one of the most powerful obligations is obligation 611. We don't know, maybe we'll have a separate workshop on it or, or maybe it just has been, you know, not meant. It appears to be, as the one which gives the tools in hands of horizontal competitors who can actually benefit from, from accessing the, the, the important data. Do you see some similar technicalities which, where you can circumvent the substance of this obligation or it's something that which appears to be more promising on, on surface at least? Yes, first I, I was surprised not to see in the workshop on data related obligations, the, the very provision on data sharing. Um, but then again, maybe it's not surprising because I think you said it's the most powerful. I'm not so sure if it's the most powerful, um, but it, in my view, is certainly the most challenging of all the obligations with the most, the most question marks uh, actually attached to it. How to actually implement this in a meaningful, in a meaningful way. So I already criticized in the beginning that the notion of this particular regulation 611 is to actually have contestability in the narrow sense. So the idea seems to be it's data provided by a search engine or by the dominant gatekeeping search engines to other search engines. Uh, and not to other players that find the data useful and to develop, you know, other services, but for other search engines. So it's it it is contestability in the narrow sense, um, and I don't even know if that's if that's an, a, a useful goal because I think if something's going to supplant Google, or it's not going to look like Google, it's not probably not going to be you know Bing supplanting Google, and if even if Bing would be supplanting Google, would be would be in the better world or not? And then Bing also has to provide data to Google, by the way, under 611 yeah, as it stands, because it's a gatekeeper in search engines in its own right, most probably, unless they get an exception. And uh, so, uh, and and then we we are not clear whether we're in a better world with this. But I do think data sharing generally is a very good provision um, because and about data sharing, and that's the only provision in the whole DMA that would allow for bulk data sharing. So data sharing not initiated through data portability by the user, but actually broad data, broad in the sense of representative about a, a whole consumer population being shared with another service. So if we interpret other search engines as being more general. So you have a search functionality somewhere in your service, then you're a search engine. And so more or less every digital service can 
can receive that kind of data to develop something with it. And then also we can share broad data, but that's very limited in the sense of how deep it is. it can be, deepness in the sense of pertaining to a particular user profile, um, because that could not be privacy done in the privacy preserving way. So we can share broad data with other services. And then in addition, we can have data portability, which allows to use deep data, but not very broad data. So deep with respect to one user, but not very broad, not representative of the consumer population. But now we can a little bit square the circle if we put the two together. So in a 611, we can share, I mean, this is only alluding to search engines, which I think is a mistake. It should be more generally also applying to other uh, core platform services and not only to search engines. And then in combination with data portability, we could share on the one hand broad representative data, but which is kind of shallow. It's not very deep in the sense of what we can learn about a specific user. And then on top, we have data portability, which only a few consumers will potentially act upon. And so it's not broad, but it's deep. And then we can have a little bit of both and actually share data, deep deep and broad data in a, in a privacy preserving way. That opportunity is missed uh, as it stands in the DMA because the one is only alluding to the search engines on the recipient end. And then there's so many questions on how to actually do this uh, in um, what is the right arrangement? This is not continuous data to be shared. Um, so is it only a snapshot of the data that's that's being shared? How old is that snapshot of data? Because also here, recency is of the essence if you actually want to use that data for competition purposes. Um, do we have data going into a data trust? How do you do the anonymization of the data? There's a huge trade-off between being the data being useful and actually at a deep level. Uh, as I said before, and uh, being privacy preserving. De-anonymization is a huge issue with that kind of click and query data. Um, and I really, I really don't have, there's more, I have many, many questions on this. I have very few answers uh, on how to do this in a, in a really meaningful way. Um, if we only share small snapshots of the data, um, fine, now well, there's gonna be a way to do it. If we really wanna share the bulk of the data, and the empirical evidence and the computer science literature also tells us that, yes, you actually need to share a lot of the data in order for it to be meaningful because the, the, the frequent search terms, those are the ones that also the competitors have. What's, what's really unique is the rare search terms, the new search terms. So, but there are many of them. Uh, and not in a high frequency. So if you just random sample out of the search terms, you're not going to get the rare ones as often as you would need. And I could go on for hours, but, you know, I'll stop here. Actually, can I ask a question on, uh, on that? Uh, so I never focused much on, on 611 because I always thought it was the, the odd one out, right? The, this is very narrow, narrow contestability it tries to achieve. And I thought, yeah, you can forget about this uh, bringing about the new Google as the provision seems to want to bring this about. Uh, but then for what other core platform service could it perhaps make more sense, this type of provision? Could, could this have made more sense for, I don't know, social social networks or, or any other virtual assistants? Could this have made more sense there or more, a higher rate of success, this type of uh, horizontal uh, data sharing? Well, I mean, the general notion is that we tend to believe that um, some of the core platform services are in a unique position to gather, to gather data about consumers, consumer preferences, which then allows them also to venture into new markets with that sort of data advantage being in mind, data being repurposed for a new service to be, to be meaningful per personalization or whatever issues. So there is no reason to believe that should be limited to search in the first place. Um, with search, you have this particular effect, and there's also a particular series of papers that originated or gave rise to this particular provision uh, that uh, the click and query data give rise to a data-driven network effect, and then it, it's useful to optimize your algorithms, and so you cannot really compete on an algorithmic level even. But, um, you know, think of, I don't know, 
even app stores or something like this. Yeah. So um, there is uh, data on on which apps are popular, which uh, there's lots of research actually on app stores and innovation, but all of them are struggling with good data availability on actually what is the downloads of the ranks of, of these some of these apps. You know what what and you're trying to scrape data from the web uh, as a proxy and so on. So again, my my take is not so much for contestability in the narrow sense, but freeing that data from the silos that's been user generated you know, um, and uh, open it up to others to actually go for innovation in different areas, develop new services that we might not think of today. And then from there, venture into something bigger or become something bigger that can exert then some uh, implicit competitive pressure. And if you, if you, if you read the provision uh, literally, it never refers to the gatekeeper who who operate who who operates core platform service or search engine. So it actually uh, allows for it would it mandates any any gatekeeper essentially who has any search related data to share them with potential online with those who operate on online platform services. So it, the implication of this provision might be potentially broader than only for Google, uh, I don't know if it's, if it's on purpose or whatever the, 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 the objective is, we, we will see, maybe the, the commission will host a separate workshop on, on this at, uh, at some point. Yeah, so but the recipients, can... the recipients are online search engines the which are defined in the law, right? So, um, yes. But the scope of the data you can collect, you can you can collect also from 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 uh, east uh, marketplaces and uh, search uh, uh, social media even. No, that's right. It just says the the gatekeeper, and it does not say search engine gate core platform services. You're right on that. Yeah. But the but the data it has to share has to be generate has to have been generated in relation to to a search engine. So the gatekeeper should still have been providing a, a search engine, which is also, which is defined in the in the DMA as as Jan said. But maybe said, there's something in the recital. I don't know yeah. that by heart now. Yeah, on this. Yeah, on its search engines. Yeah, unless we we presume that search engines uh, are also you know not necessarily yeah. horizontal yeah. but also uh, sectoral niches. Yeah, but that's that's. What, but still, it's really interesting to see how it will function in, 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 in practice and so many open questions. And if I might close uh, this conversation is asking you, uh, do you think in general uh, the gatekeepers would prefer the model where everything is somehow uh, very, very well explained to them? What they have to be happy with complying with everything as long as it's clear and in advance. So they are happy to do this rational sacrifices if they're manageable and you can somehow factor or co sign them off as costs. Uh, or on the contrary, they prefer broad, uh, vague language and uh, allowing them room for interpretation and designing all these behavioral techniques, never ending uh, strategies. Which 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 um, scenario appears to be more powerful for regulator for the enforcers? Maybe we can uh, channel the message to those who design similar similar uh, toolkit in in other jurisdictions. From the gatekeeper's perspective, I think had it been broader, the, where the DMA is broad, you hear them saying it's too broad and too vague, and we don't know exactly what it means. And and where it is very specific, is they will say, oh, it's very specific. It's technically impossible to do this. It should have been different. So I think you can't really pick. You can't really pick right. What I think would have been perhaps helpful for the for the DMA is what we see in the in the UK now with the proposed bill where it, it is very similar you know the what they've listed in the in the types of of obligations they, they call it different the conduct requirements they call them um they're very similar to the ones of the DMA you could you could map them but um what the regulator can do there is kind of targeted to each to each gatekeeper or firm with significant market uh, status so there you have because, for example, the DMA obligation on search, this is just, or, well, now we, we there were some doubts after our, our after the previous question, but this seems to be very much, dear Google, please comply with this. And other obligations, the one on using the data of business users in competition with, um, uh, with them, that seems to be very much, dear Amazon, please comply with this. So perhaps something of a more curated uh, list for each each gatekeeper where the regulator can 
compose a list of what applies to that specific gatekeeper would have been more more useful and that can be a list that can be changed over time so it doesn't have to be fixed um if a gatekeeper then uh, turns out to be engaging in also other types of business activities that that uh, prove to be problematic um but i think that would have helped a lot with with the vagueness arguments that we hear a bit uh, surrounding the the dma so that would be my uh, my suggestion well i guess the dma is the answer to 101 102 tfeu which are very broad yeah. and the advantage of that and the has been over the years that it's very versatile we can adapt it to you know almost anything even digital markets um, but then it's also proven because it's so broad that we have these endless litigation processes uh, in a very quickly evolving market, um, uh, which have not worked so well because you could argue your way out of everything and there was an efficiency defense. And yes, there are a lot of efficiencies involved here um, that you can always bring forward. And then that's it's a weighing game. So the DMA is on more or less the other end of the spectrum. Yes, we've we've still talked about the fact that it's still vague in certain places. What does a you know friend mean? What does uh, what is a what scope of data is, is potentially covered? What is a search engine and what not and so on? Yes, but I think these are relatively specific questions as opposed to the ones that you would have under under competition law. And there is very you know, relatively little you can argue your way around it. I'm not saying nothing you can do, um, but uh, it, it's much more precise. But then it runs, of course, the risk of first not being future-proof, which um, might also be the case for for the DMA, um, that we will have to revise it quite heavily and maybe to build it a little bit more from the ground up in the future, which then might look very different. Uh, much more what the UK has done. Uh, but then, of course, you move more towards the spectrum of, you know, being in the context of having to argue with these firms and their lawyers. Uh, and again, these are the most powerful companies on the planet as we speak. So I think it was the right choice generally to be rather uh, over, in so on, on the spectrum of over specific uh, for the DMA to start out with and to gain more experiences. And still, we see a lot of argumentation when it comes to implementation now. And uh, once we've resolved that and made some experiences, maybe it's time to revise. But unfortunately, history also tells us that uh, lawmakers are not very good to revise and repeal existing regulations. They're usually here to stay. I would even argue that with the DMA, the platform to business regulation has become largely obsolete. And yes, there's there's uh, there's just a revision of that, or it's just been um, a revision of that, whether it's it's supposed to stay or not, or it's still ongoing actually. And there's no indications that's going to be repealed after after the DMA is in place. Um, so that can create a patchwork, and that of course is not good. Thank you very much, Jan. It's a pity Chris cannot uh, answer this question because he, he is disconnected at the moment. But we have this tradition uh, to, to end our meetings with, with asking the guests to provide some uh, ideas, recommendations for students, for those who just start, uh, who join the race. So to say, it's really exciting time now. And of course, there are many shortcomings of this time and many opportunities. So maybe we can uh, suggest some um, recommendations Natalia, starting with you, uh, how how to 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 navigate in this labyrinth or this hodgepodge of different events and uh, development? I'm tempted to go for the the cheap answer that that I'm still a student, so I'll just take the the advice in and and remain silent. Um, that's what PhD students do. You know, when they want a student discount, they say they're a student. When on LinkedIn, they say they're a researcher. To sound more more serious, um, no, but okay. Uh, on on a more serious note. I think I would tell students to, first of all, uh, listen to this YouTube channel more because not necessarily this video, if they've made it to the end, that's already great. But there's there's a bunch of videos which I love to to listen to. And, and this should be also, this should become a podcast. I think this should be on, on Spotify to listen to it on the go. I love it. And then my other um, piece of advice would be to not get caught up with the latest piece of legislation, which is perhaps what I've been doing in my PhD so far with the DMA, but 
but to get the the overall overview of what's going on in the field and the dma is the latest uh, flashy piece in in the competition corner but but competition still goes on and and there's that's a whole field on its own and then there's you know data act ai act there's so much to take in and and i think it's always valuable to kind of know what's what's going on in general and what has been going on in the past and where we might be in the future, which might be not necessarily so DMA focused as we are right now in, in every conference, but that would be my advice. Yeah, it's a it's always a difficult question, of course, uh, but I think the, 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 the most important aspect for me for new researchers to come in or students to come in is to see the value actually of having an interdisciplinary openness. On this subject because we've seen the dma is the beginning it's not the end is not the end of it there's many difficult questions legal questions economic questions technical questions associated still with it but not a legal scholar economist or a computer scientist can solve them alone you need knowledge of all three disciplines really to advance here. Uh, you can not call for a regulation if you don't know um, what is technically feasible and what is silly. Um, and uh, you also need to keep in mind sort of the economics of things and behavioral aspects, behavioral economics as well, very much so. And of course, at the same time, you need to be able to have the existing regulatory legal landscape in mind um, when, when you're designing new regulations. And what I see too little, is really people that, I mean, there is a strong axis in law and economics traditionally, but there's not such a strong axis in so the legal technology uh, domain or in the, the uh, economic technological domain with respect to these uh, issues that we talk about. And uh, so I would really encourage students to look beyond the fence, uh, beyond their the, the walls of their discipline, to be much more open, to actually take courses also in, in these domains, um, and then be to be in the know in a un very unique position to actually speak to these issues and to develop new regulations or new tools that uh, can implement these regulations. Talk to a lot of different people to get a lot of different perspectives as you build your thinking about work, because the greatest weakness all of us have is, is, is myopia. Natalia Moreno, Jan Kramer, Chris Rivet, thank you very much for joining this conversation today.